Welcome to Age of Empires 2, the world's premier real-time strategy game. This is one of those miracle games that despite being old still has a thriving competitive scene and a steady supply of DLC updates, meaning it's every gamer's dream to become good at Age of Empires 2. Now I have many talents and perks, like my galaxy-sized brain that loves strategy games and my smooth, buttery British accent. Unfortunately, Age of Empires has always been a series that I am woefully bad at. I mean, sure, I can cheese the AI as much as the next person, but when it comes to other players, ooh, I'm about as effective as an Englishman with no ears, eyes, or brain, otherwise known as your average resident of Slough. So today I'll be doing what I do best and abusing a weird little feature that I noticed while watching a replay of a competitive game. In this replay, one of the players was seemingly able to make far more gold than was normal, and upon closer inspection of their actions I discovered they were using a, uh, secret exploit. Oh, <laughs> highly illegal indeed, but all of the most enjoyable things are. I love you tax evasion. So it's time for me to show off how to pull off the infinite gold glitch in Age of Empires 2 that will 100% get you permabanned from ranked matches, but will allow you to abuse the AI to new heights and of course your few remaining friends if you can convince them to join you in a multiplayer match anymore. For today's game, I'll be playing as the Spanish on a team with the Burmese. Whilst this exploit can be pulled off with any faction, it does require us finding at least one relic, and having a good outlet to sink money into. In our case, Spain can train some of the most overpowered monks in the game using just gold, allowing us to potentially wololo our way to victory. So whilst I set up my early empire, I think it's important to ask what is gold and how do you make it? Gold is the most versatile resource in the game, as we can use it in a market to buy every other resource. It is however heavily limited by supply. Gold mining is the fastest way to get gold but quickly runs out. You can trade with allies for a little bit of extra gold on the side and finally relics can be stationed inside of a monastery to make a pittance of gold. Each relic produces 0.5 gold per second and seeing that there are only 8 relics on this entire map it hardly makes it worthwhile to focus on them. But this isn't a normal game, and I'm not a normal gamer, ladies and gentlemen, as I have learned the secret art of duplicating relics. So our opening strategy is to rush to the castle age as fast as possible so that we can build our first monastery. Ah, what a refreshing style of gameplay. Almost like the refreshing taste of Yorkshire tea gold, which of course you should be drinking. You don't want to be classed as a barbarian, do you? Go make yourself a cup of tea. Anyway, once we've built our first monastery, we then spend 100 gold to train our first monk. The monk is a very versatile unit in AoE 2, largely used for healing, converting, and collecting relics. In our case, this one monk is going to provide more value to our economy than 500 peasants. Our first step is to walk this old man outside of our walls and down to our closest relic. He can then pick it up and deposit it safely inside of our monastery to start making money. But instead of doing that, we wait for him to slowly break his bones, lifting this bad boy back up the hill and get him to place it near the church using the drop relic ability. Now we then want to select our monk and have him pick up the relic again and then right click on the monastery so that he'll begin walking over to it with the goal of placing this relic inside. However, if before our monk actually reaches the monastery we make him drop the relic, it then drops the relic being carried but glitches the monk. Despite the monk having left the original relic way over there, he turns up and proudly deposits a new relic that he is somehow summoned out of thin air. The game is so committed to the monk depositing the relic, it gives up tracking the original and is happy to say that sure yeah that rock you found on the way here well that looks like it could be a religious artifact so we have just turned one relic into two relics but why stop there we can of course immediately repeat this process by once again making our monk pick up the real relic then go to deposit it and accidentally drop it on root and submit i don't know a flake of skin as the dandruff of christ ah what an artifact in fact it is so easy i will now repeat this process until i've filled the monastery with 20 relics there we go, we now have a building that is self-sufficiently producing 10 gold per second. Now this is of course rather powerful, as we control more relics than the map actually even started with, which in my opinion is rather accurate of medieval Europe. It was once famously said that if you put all of the relics claiming to be a fragment of the true cross together, you'd end up with enough wood to build a boat. So if anything, this is a more historically accurate playstyle of Age of Empires. Shenanigans aside, the game is still pretty neck and neck despite my unfair advantage. 
However, I intend to handicap myself further by limiting my recruitment pool to basically just monks. This allows us to pull the age-old Uno reverse card strategy and convince the enemy army to, instead of fighting us, join us, using the power of a bunch of old men throwing out a sick diss track. So if we want an army of monks, I'm going to need a city of churches, and to rapidly fill those churches with duplicated relics. Thanks to the gold we're already generating, I'm able to push for an early imperial age by abusing the market instead of actually growing my natural peasant economy or watching the T90 official guide to proper farm placement. Whilst our old friend is busy filling up church number two, we have actually finished constructing a fourth church, raising our gold making potential up to 40 gold per second, provided we can fill every slot. Now my ally here, Sifu, has discovered that we're doing financially rather well, and like your average mother-in-law is starting to demand a bit of this financial stability. In fact, they're demanding I give them some wood. Okay, do not give your mother-in-law some wood, that is terrible advice. But nonetheless, I will of course oblige and share my profitability, as they will be defending me whilst I strive for economic success. After building my castle, I'm now able to start investing some of my giant money pile into improving my monks. I've given them improved range, improved conversion, speed and even the ability to convert a building. Don't ask me how these old men can will a French hovel into becoming a Spanish hovel, but life finds a way. We're now researching our way into the Imperial Age as I fill up our 6th and 7th monastery with relics. Gold is now just raining from the sky and the game has taken a notice by placing my team at the top of the scoreboard. My teammate has also noticed and keeps sending demands for handouts. Jeez! Make your own money exploit! So with 8 churches now built and filled with relics, we are generating 80 gold per second. This means we can afford to build one monk each second and hardly lose any gold. So I think it's about time we put our money where our mouth is and buy some shouty boys to go and harass the yellow and green team. Ah, my first monk armada is ready for war, so let us begin the march towards the yellow base. Annoyingly, whilst I am trying to tactically steal this archery range, I'm ambushed by mounted knights. Now this does mean I will lose many monks, but I do get to gain some new friends in the form of these converted blue knights. But yes, with 20 monks now dead, I think it's safe to say we need a bigger blob of them and to prioritize targeting enemy units as opposed to buildings. Okay, and just a few moments later, the second blob of battle monks is ready. This time, backed up by our captured knights from earlier. This will let us distract the enemy, giving us time to convert their units to our cause. And by the time we breach the walls, our monk forces swelled to over 30 on the front line, with an additional 20 reserves en route. 50 monks might seem a little excessive, but this is less than a minute's worth of our gold production. Backed up by our teammate, we have a free run into the center of the yellow base, and we get to convert everything we can see, and oh my, is that elephants? Yes, these are elite battle elephants, and in just a few seconds we can take control over all of them. Oh my goodness, and then we can just use them to smash down the yellow town center and knock them out of the game. Ah yes, the hubris of the green faction has given me the weapons to destroy its yellow friend. And with them now gone from the game, it only makes sense to continue the steamroll and barrel my forces into the green district. I noticed they've been producing a huge quantity of ballistas, and I eventually realized that I could just convert them from a very safe distance. Oh, and I discovered the fine art of battering rams. These bad boys have a huge amount of health, very resistant to range damage, and cannot resist monks in any way, making them very easy to steal. So, with the first team eventually defeated, I began sinking some more money into our ally, whilst I amassed some more monks in preparation for taking on the pink and cyan team. It soon became clear that Cyan had built a giant castle between us and their wall, meaning we would need to steal more siege equipment if we wanted to stand a chance of an assault. Unfortunately, the news of a large enemy build-up did not reach the 20 new monks I trained, so they bravely marched single file towards their instant death. But in times of strife, I like to remember the important words of Lord Farquaad. Some of you may die, but that is a sacrifice I am more than willing to take. Ah, as you can see, the AI here is executing a brilliant strategy by feeding me an entire wing to Sar for free. 
Anyway, I launched my first attack on the castle and very quickly realized that I'm gonna need more rams. So I executed a galaxy brain maneuver and just waited beyond the reach of the castle for the AI to send battering rams towards me. Ah, I sent an opportunity to attack as upon us as I've just defeated the defenders of the castle, so now we can steal the remaining siege equipment that Cyan has built for us and make a move on both fronts with our monks. And with enough distracting units available, we're able to finally strike down the castle without anyone being able to stop us. Once the castle was down, I had to wait for my next 50 monks to be trained so that I could rebolster my army. This left me with about six battering rams that had nothing to do. So naturally I just thought, ah, why not send them up the hill to solo the entirety of the base? I of course supported them with the few remaining monks I had and used their conversion to snipe off any military response we found, allowing me to have the easiest conquest of the game so far as my upgraded battering rams simply pulverized the entirety of the Cyan Empire into the ground. Meanwhile, off screen my ally has managed to snipe the orange faction, so evidently I need to up my game a little and immediately continue my march into the purple city. I am starting to encounter a population cap issue as we are simply producing too many monks. We don't even have enough houses in our empire for them. So whilst I zone out an entire city, it's time to send 60 monks up a hill to attack the purple army. Attack is now the correct term by the way as purple has researched the ability to resist conversion. So instead of their army joining our side, they simply have a heart attack and die on the spot. It does make it harder for me to snowball but an army of 20 skirmishers is still not going to stop 50 hype lads sending your heart into overdrive, all whilst my army of battering ram sidesteps you. At this point my ally has taken the 50,000 gold I've handed them and knocked out another AI, leaving just the shambles of a pink player to try and solo team hyperinflation. Naturally they can't do anything and my battering rams slowly waddle their way through their empire and melt their town center into the ground. Ah, Age of Empires 2, a perfectly balanced game with no exploits. With the game complete and us victorious, this now brings us to the most important screen of the game, the stat screen. This is the best screen in the game because it clearly shows that we were the best player. We had the largest army and converted the most units. I mean, we also lost 216 units, but, but how can you even celebrate victory if not atop a pile of your friend's own corpses? And finally, the most important statistic of all, the gold collected stat. As you can see, we made 110,000 gold this game which is enough to make over 1,000 battle monks. Now as of making this video, the exploit does still work. However, using it in any public lobbies is a surefire way to get banned. So um, keep it to silly games with friends or maybe use it to beat the game on the hardest difficulty. Either way, this power is now yours to enjoy. So go and conquer the French or something. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to give it a like. But most of all, I have a question for you. I absolutely love Age of Empires 2 and I think it's a brilliant brilliant game, but I want to know if you've actually ever played it, and if so, which Age of Empires game is your favourite? Tell me all about it in the comments section. Anyway, as always, a massive thank you to each and every one of our Patreons and YouTube channel members for funding these glorious videos. Look at their shiny, majestic names on screen. Ah, thank you. Anyway, as always, thank you for watching, and I will see each and every one of you in the next one. Have a glorious day, you majestic sausages, and goodbye for now.